Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Jazakum Allah khair for joining us for another episode of Sincerely Yours. This is your host Ibrahim Hindi with my co-host Sheikh Abdullah Oduru. Sheikh Abdullah, how are you doing? Alhamdulillah. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. Thank you for joining us and being consistent with us. May Allah reward you all, inshallah. I'm good, man. Uh, mashallah, I love that that color of your thawb. It's amazing. <laughs> Appreciate it, alhamdulillah. What is it, like an off blue or something? Yeah, kind of like an off royal blue. We don't want to be too royal, Yanni. Let him hit dunya. We don't love the dunya, brother. We got to keep it humble. <laughs> mashallah, mashallah. I like, I've, I feel like my whole life is a quest of like seeing people in like really nice thawbs and being like, where did you get that from? I need to like find out to go there and get a nice thawb for myself. <laughs> when, you, when you go to Medina, man, I'll tell you the tailor. I just go to the tailors, man. There's some tailors that we have. So, alhamdulillah. Let me know, inshallah. I'm heading there soon, bidnillah. I will. Inshallah. Uh, as always, everyone, we're uh, delighted to hear from all of you. Please let us know, inshallah, uh, where you're coming to us from, where you're watching from. Uh, we want to interact with you. We want to hear from you. If you have questions uh, during today's session, put it in the chat. We want to hear from everyone, inshallah. Um, one comment from Brother Yahya says, you guys are all on time today. And he's laughing. And it's true. <laughs> <laughs> we are on time today. Jazakallah <laughs> khair. I see uh, Brother Asmar from Nigeria. Assalamu alaikum. Sister Aisha from Somaliland, which is different than Somalia. People should know that. Um, Assalamu alaikum as well. Uh, let us know, inshallah, where everyone is coming from. We want to hear from all of you. Blue Man from Toronto, mashallah. Blue Man's with us, I think, every week. I love seeing the, the usernames, and I'm getting used to all the people who are joining us. Blue Man. Alhamdulillah. Blue man. I don't know if he's got the same thelb as you, Sheikh. <laughs> well, I think this is, it's, it's, he's calling himself Blue Man because of the Toronto. Uh, what team is it? That's blue? blue. Blue Jays? Blue Jays. Yeah. Maybe. There's no baseball anymore. <laughs> uh, I don't know if you heard about that. No. I'm not, I'm, I'm not a baseball fan. So. <laughs> <laughs> we have Sister Bassi, first time watching from South Africa. Assalamu alaikum. MashaAllah. Ahlan, ahlan, ahlan. Allah, welcome, welcome. The, the, we have a lot of uh, folks from Africa watching us. I think because we've been bigging it up late, lately, talking about all the countries in Africa we want to visit. So our viewers are going up, alhamdulillah. Well, we have a great uh, show today, a great guest, alhamdulillah. Uh, someone who is familiar to both myself and Sheikh Abdullah, Dr. Osman uh, Umarji, inshallah, will be joining us. He is the Director of Survey Research and Evaluation. He has a Bachelor's of Science in Electrical Engineering and a Master's and a PhD in Educational Psychology from UC Irvine. He has studied Islam at Al-Azhar University in Cairo, Egypt. Dr. Umarji is also an adjunct pr professor in the School of Education at UC Irvine. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Osman, how are you? Wa alaikum as wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Alhamdulillah, doing phenomenal. Great to be with you both today. And that great to see you as well. You know, every week I feel like I'm giving Sheikh Abdullah a bit of a hard time because I live in Canada and it's really cold and he lives in Texas and he's got great weather. But uh, I think you have both of us beat today because you're coming from California. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Yes, we, we are blessed with good weather. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> so two Americans on the scene, brother. Watch what you say. <laughs> <laughs> that's true past few weeks have been two canadians against one, one american yeah, yes. yes. we flipped the tables a little bit alhamdulillah alhamdulillah uh dr osman you know part of the, the the point of these sessions these live sessions that we're holding is uh you know to help introduce people to uh the people they're gaining knowledge from and so i know a lot of people by tuning into yaqeen by reading our papers by uh, consuming the infographics, a lot of the work that they've been seeing has been work coming through either you personally or your department uh, within Yaqeen. And so, um, you know, people want to get to know the person behind the information, the content that they're consuming, who is the person behind the khutbah, who is the person behind, you know, the paper that they're reading. Um, and so that's kind of the point of all of this is to, you know, get to know 
our mashayikh better, to get to know our students of knowledge better, and to build, inshallah, deeper and better connection. So, Sheikh, you know, tell us about your story. How did you decide to start pursuing knowledge? You know, when did you make that decision, and how did how did it go? Bismillah. Oh man, it takes me back now. Twenty years, approximately, no, more than that now, about twenty-two years ago. Um, so I was raised a bit about myself. I was raised in Southern California. I was born in Los Angeles, uh, a culturally practicing Muslim um, Pakistani household. So, you know, we observed, you know, all the, the cultural rituals of Islam. But um, definitely it was when I walked into college was a time that I made a conscious decision to be a practicing Muslim. And the story behind that is essentially that, you know, first time tasting freedom. So I went off to a university about an hour from my house. And I was always, you know, staying out of like, I avoided the Kaba'i, let's put it that way, right? I stayed away from all the, the major sins of Islam. Um, and I get to college and I'm living on my own in the dorms. And it's like freedom, right? It's like absolute autonomy. It's like, do what you want. And, you know, I'm a curious 18 year old man, right? I'm like, I wonder what this world is like and what do people do? And so um, the dorm experience really just opened my eyes, to the realities of kind of how people live in this world. So for me, myself, just, I mean, that's a long backstory, but like, I love sports. So I got into the, the gym regularly, you know, you can't, I mean, when Sheikh Abdullah's on the screen, you know, it doesn't look like I go to the gym at all, right? You know, but like, you know, I did at some point in time, right? I was, was going to the gym regularly. I was hanging out with my dorm friends, you know, we would just play poker late into the night. Uh, and I was just, just kind of getting my feet wet with like independence in life. But then what ended up happening in a few months in the first term was I started to see like the devastating effect of like people who live a life of disbelief or people who don't have Allah in their life. And so even though I was just culturally practicing, right, I was still just kind of like observant of certain cultural rules and, and I wouldn't cross my boundaries. But, you know, in college, everyone is trying to figure out their identity, right? We're 18 years old. And so the fraternity started coming around and they're like, hey, they want to get people to rush, right? And so this is a, maybe a U.S. thing. So maybe for you know, people in other countries, like fraternities are these clubs, right? They have, they're, they're, they're for men. And typically, it's not good stuff that happens there, right? Not very bad other stuff. But, you know, when you're 18 years old and, you know, people are saying, hey, come and join us. We want you to be a part of our brotherhood, essentially, right? It was, you know, it makes you feel, you know, a sense of, okay, someone values me. So, hmm. you know, I, I, I spent some time with those people just kind of from a distance observing what they do, went to their houses at times. And immediately I was like, man, this lifestyle is disgusting. Right? This is disgusting. The things that they do, it's just about alcohol, marijuana, relationships. And same thing I saw in my dorm. So in about three months of living that, of seeing that life, right? I was, I was seeing it kind of from, a, from as like a, almost like a, as an observer. I said to myself one day, I said, you know, I, I, this, is, this, is, this is not how I, I don't think I want to live my life this way. So one day I randomly like decided to just open the Quran. You know, I had a Quran, like, you know, every Muslim has that Quran on their shelf somewhere. It gets dusty for a while. We just pull it off the shelf, you know, pull that dust off of it. You know, opened it up, randomly do a page, and I read Surah Al Takathur and Surah Al Qari'ah, both of the surah. And nothing happens randomly, right? You know, so Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, I believe, was sending me a signal about what are you doing with your life and why are you exploring all these crazy things that are out there. And so I think at that moment it really hit me and it shook me that like I probably need to take my life a whole lot more seriously. And that started my path of becoming practicing which led me to the MSU, Muslim Student Union at UC Irvine. And from there, you know, that's, that was kind of what set off this whole path of seeking knowledge. Mm. Mm. Nice, inshallah. You know, this might take us a little bit off tangent, but, um, <clears throat> you know, that interesting question, because I think a lot of people have maybe a similar experience. They go, they experience, you know, a life that's different than the life that Islam expects of us. And then, you know, they realize that it's not all it's cracked up to be and they kind of come back. Um, but at the same time, I think all of us also know people who, you know, also left their home. As soon as they left their home, they went to, to university, they saw this life and they just, you know, drank from it. And they just went, you know, pardon the euphemism, but they just go completely into it and they never come back. And I think a lot of parents, you know, especially myself, you know, alhamdulillah, Allah has blessed me with children and I worry about them now. And I worry about this question, like, am I sheltering them too much? Should they be exposed to this life? How do I make sure that when they're exposed to it, they have enough to help bring them back? And maybe there's no full answer to it, but I, I would love to know, you know, your insights, what you think about that. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think about this all the time for myself and my own kids. Um, 
And it's a tension I deal with every single day, right? I teach adolescent development in the university. So my entire course is on, you know, teaching people about what the teenage years are about. And Muslim parents are always wondering the same. And what I see is, unfortunately, two extremes often, right? People say, you know what, we live in the West. They got to learn to live like, like the Westerners. And they throw them into, you know, everything as if like, that's just, that's just, they will learn, right? And they'll figure this out. And I generally find that that leads to a whole lot of bad outcomes because it's just too hard to develop a solid identity that way, right? And then I see the opposite, which is, no, we're living in a situation where there's like, Islam is not like the dominant culture. So we're going to just kind of shelter our kids at home completely. And to the extent that these kids, when they actually hit the real world, it's like they have no idea how to function. Actually, I've seen this myself, where I've seen these kids who are 16, 17, they don't know how to function around non-Muslims in any way, shape, or form. Um, so what is the happy medium? I think we're, we'll know the answer in the coming decades as Muslims spend more and more time in the West. So, you know, tune back in for, you know, in 20 years, we'll give you the answer to that, right? But no, but I, I, I deeply think that at the very basic aspect of it, it's like, it's a developmental question. It's like, when, when do you think your kid, like, would you say to a five-year-old or three-year-old, hey, you're going to have to learn to use fire, so you might as well play with fire at the age of two or three, right? You're going to say, no, it's probably not a good idea. you got to have some skills some some motor skills i know how to use your hands you got to know like you know how things burn and eventually i'll expose you to it in a very you know like there's a dosage of how you can get acclimated to playing with fire so i think when we come to dealing with the society around us we have to be very mindful of the same thing right you can't throw them in prematurely once you feel like their faith is firm they've got some solid uh attachment to allah and his messenger right they know like the moral compass of islam i think at that point right selectively letting them go right um will be a little bit safer than saying they'll figure it out on their own. Allah Allah. Sheikh, so alhamdulillah, you said you, you mentioned something and it kind of ties into what you're talking about now. Um, you said freedom, right? When you went to college, it was like, yes, freedom. I mean, I remember even as anonymous, I remember had my first car, freedom. I get to go out by myself. I don't have to call mom, dad to take me somewhere, come home late, come home when they don't, you know, they're asleep or whatever. So, like you mentioned, it's that 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 sweet spot for parents um, to determine whether their children are ready to go. And like you mentioned, a lot of times, you know, may Allah bless the Hafal teachers and the Hafal, but they're in these institutions and then they're going straight to, uh, you know, it, it was all boys at, at Quran school, but then they're going straight to uh, it's it's you know all genders, both genders, both genders in 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 uh, in, in college, and they're they're hit with a quote unquote rude awakening. So what would you tell like the 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 parents when you said freedom that really hit because do they realize that before college they may not be free if you could explain that you know what that just break that down for us for especially the parents to understand that about their children yeah so um a couple things so the first is this notion that um the young developing person needs to feel a sense of autonomy in their life. This is the hallmark actually of adolescence and being growing from being a boy or, or a girl into being a man or a woman. It's that feeling that I have control over my life. And so it's, it's, it's part of human development, right? The brain actually changes in that way, right? That it seeks out, you know, certain types of experiences. Um, it actually seeks out risk because the brain also wants uh, rewarding experiences. That's why like young people, like teenagers, they do crazy things, right? We all, we all did this as kids, right? You know, we're looking for thrills, we want roller coasters. Now when you're like, you know, our age, it's like, who wants to go on a roller coaster, right? You know, it's like, I would know I exposed myself to that, right? But young kids, it's like, I want to do this. And it's because Allah has made their brain in that fashion. So if the parents don't recognize that the young person's brain is looking for experiences to have autonomy, and experiences to have thrill seeking and they try to prohibit that they're going to find it in some way that you don't want them to do oh. so i always tell this to parents you have for it, like you've got to let them do it but let them do it in a way that is safe so again like i mean it can go off the boat here but like tiktok right is like a common thing there's these tiktok challenges that more like kids do right and it's like crazy stuff if you look at them it's like um slap your teacher all right, I remember telling this to my students in the university. I said, this is a TikTok challenge. It says, I dare one of you to come and slap me, right? We'll see what happens, right? You know, because like, that is literally a challenge, right? Or it's like, go and do this, like your best friend's like, one of them was like, go and kiss your best friend's girlfriend, right? This is like disgusting stuff. But it's like, the point is the more crazy, right? And the more like audacious it is, the more the adolescent brain is like, that feels good. That feels good. 
So if you make these kids never get that feeling by doing like these exhilarating things, they're going to do it in a way that we don't think is healthy. So what can you do? Let them have that space to do it in the halal. So I talk to my daughter all the time, right? She's only 12, right? But, you know, they all, they're 12, but you feel like they're 16 or 18 with the way they, they think about life, right? It's like, what do you want to do? I want to go, bun- I want to go bungee jumping. I want to go skydiving, right? Those are the things that she asked me to do. And I'm like, well, I looked it up. I'm like, you can't go till you're 18 by the law. But it's like, what thrill, what thrill seeking experiences can I give you that you choose that will make you feel like you're getting that sense of that like, you choose what you're doing, you're getting the thrills and you kind of get it out of your system in some way, right? So that's one aspect I think of freedom that we have to acknowledge is that like we like none of us like to be controlled by our wives, our husbands, our employers, or anything else. So why do we think that our kids would enjoy being controlled by their parents, right? Mm, you know that reminds me. I remember one time I was giving a lecture to the youth a long time ago, <laughs> and I, I I respect this young young man. He came up to me after the lecture, and he was like, "Shay, I understand everything that you were saying and what we're supposed to do, and this is what he told me, Shay. This is what he told me." He said, but, you know, you weren't Muslim before, and I just want to taste that. I just want to do it once, man. Is that is something wrong with that? And I was like, man, I don't know if you're going to come back, bro. I don't know if you're going to come back. So that's really important that you mention that to parents, that they let them have that experiential learning, but in a way that's that's guided. Like you mentioned, I mean, you gave some solutions there. I mean, I mean, you were, we were talking about camping, about the young men and how to raise these young boys as men. And you know, the whole concept of rites of passage. I mean, yeah. for instance, in the fraternities, you have these types of initiations. You have to do some crazy things. Well, Allah be alim. Then mm-hmm. Allah is the only one that knows what you're doing and the frat brothers, you know, know <laughs> what you're doing. So I'm glad you mentioned that, you know, being that parents have to find a way. They should should find a way and not just let it happen because it can, it can be too late, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah, and also you have to take into mind of the gender of the child, right? Like boys like to do like physical aggressive things, right? And I deal with a lot of parents who are just like, I want my boy to be very calm, right? And sit in the chair, right? And read books. And I'm like, that's not how the, the fitrah is for many of these people, right? right? And the companions weren't like that, right? right? They were they were doing stuff, right? Even I tell people like the Prophet Muhammad would wrestle and take on like people, like being physically involved, exposing yourself to even danger. You might break an arm, you might break a leg, but it's part of doing these things in life. But if you don't give people a chance to do that, like I said, they're gonna go do it in a way you don't want them to do it. Yeah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. You, I mean, can you enlighten, I mean, this may bust a bow for some of these guys in the colleges, but can you enlighten the parents on, you don't have to get specific, but I, we mentioned fraternities. Like, you know, okay, the, the, the young man, he comes from a religious household, quote unquote religious household, even though he may be religious, but he feels free and he gets introduced to these fraternities. What are some guidelines you give some of these young guys uh, and girls even, you know, mm-hmm. uh, when dealing with these fraternities, that may be a Muslim fraternity, but they're not acting like, I won't even say Muslims, they're just not acting moral. Mm-hmm. So what are some guidelines you give these young men? Uh, okay, let's take a step back first, because I think the guidance has to come. The question you asked about freedom, I want to deal with that a little more deeply. Yes, what leads people to wanting to try that in the first place, right? Like this guy that came to you, this brother that said, Shif, you've been on the other side of the fence, I want to know what it's like, right? And it's this fundamental notion that Islam is restrictive and that um, there is joyful, fun, uh, wonderful things to do if only we could remove those restrictions, right? Yeah. And I think teaching our kids and teaching ourselves, to be honest, not about just for children, but teaching ourselves that Islam literally is the most liberating, free way you can live your life. Yeah. And I didn't understand that for a long time myself, right? But now that, you know, I'll be, I'll be 40 years old on Friday, Sheikh, right? You know, I'm an old man now, right? You know, I, it's with the, the Zoom, you don't see the gray, right? But like, it, those are the things that like young people are never told, right? I never been, I never ever been told that when I was a kid. It's like, look, you got to do this, you got to do this, you can't do that, you do this, you go to hell, right? Like, it's all like rules, regulations, punishments, and nothing took into a regard like my emotions, my psychology, like my needs, right? Mm-hmm. And I, I tell that to everybody, I'm like, look, believe me, like the people who do those things that you're wishing, I talk to them. I talk to my anonymous friends. I'll give you a good example, right? And I use this, by the way. So going back to your question of what do you tell the people who are now experiencing this, right? Mm-hmm. I talk to my anonymous friends to this day who are in frats and doing this stuff. We, you know, we meet up for lunch and dinner every now and then, every few months, and we catch up. And they tell me things like, man, they're like, you had it easy. I'm like, what do you mean I had it easy? Like, man, you never had a girlfriend in your life, right? 
you found one person, you married that girl, you're happy with her, right? He's like, bro, I can't find happiness with a woman. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, I've had like 30 girlfriends in my life. Right? And I said, okay. He's like, one is beautiful. One was funny. One was super intelligent. Right? One was like, you know, just, you know, so, you know whatever, like, you know, she was adventurous. So there's a trait in every girlfriend that I've had, but I can't find all those traits in one person. So I can never be satisfied with the relationship I have. Right? And I just sat there and I was like, alhamdulillah for it's time. Alhamdulillah for Islam, right? Like I'm the one who's free, enjoying like, you know, my my life. And this guy is in torment with every single person that he dates, right? So it's things like that, right? Or I've had friends who do the same thing, whether it be drugs or any other problem where it's like they are now addicted and stuck in a horrible lifestyle. And I'm like, Alhamdulillah, I never teaching people like free. You're like the most free person you can be when you stay away from these things that actually destroy your life. SubhanAllah, SubhanAllah. Yeah, that, that, that's that's uh, beautiful. Just, you, you know, you're kind of enslaved to these things and you yep. don't even realize it, you know, SubhanAllah. You know, and people realize, as you said, you know, you feel liberated. And, you know, I was telling some shiukha before about a couple years ago, because I mean, you see with the, these, these young men in particular, and it affects the females as well as like this, you know, you got the red pill movement, the MGTOW mm -hmm. movement, men going their own way and, you know, one of their tenets is like, don't get married. Why child support, prenup, all these types of things. Mm -hmm. And if the young man and woman don't understand, you know, the, the the Islamic objective behind marriage and the Islamic objective behind the whole gender relations. And just like you said, Sheikh, you know, it's just haram, haram, haram. You know, you can't communicate at all. And sometimes it's, you know, it's very, very restrictive, but they know that, you know, subhanAllah Islam is uh and just learning it and as you mentioned you know through experience as well in a, in a confined way a guided way that's the most liberating exactly. yeah it's the why like you mentioned right we've got to teach our kids and ourselves when why do we do what we do that's what makes you feel like this is the way to live right because mm -hmm. i just don't give you an example i was dealing with a case recently somebody with inheritance issues like every family knows the muslim community right there's always inheritance fights right it's like i don't understand why do i get this and why does this person get that right and when you take the time and you can show them the hikmah, right, the wisdom of Allah and how he's given inheritance, I said, look, this is going to happen to the family. This is going to break down the family and, and, and these other dimensions. I'm like, you're thinking about yourself and your bank account. Think about all these other factors. And this person stopped and was like, man, like, I didn't realize that there was that many dimensions to this, right? So it, it's, it's you, but if I just said, look, don't ask questions. This is the rule, right? That's it. So you're never going to feel satisfied, right? So, and in a society where everything's always asking you to justify what you do, right? We have to work with teaching our children and ourselves. This is the hikmah and the wisdom of Allah and all that we do. This is why we pray. This is why we fast. This is why we don't do this. This is why we do that. This is why this is haram. This is why this is obligated, right? It's like, ah, okay. Things make sense, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, sorry. So, Sheikh, like, uh, first of all, before we continue, I just want to remind everyone, inshallah, in the chat, if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. We want to hear from all of you. If you if there's anything you want to ask Dr. Osman, there is a time um, in our session today where we will take uh, questions from everyone, inshallah. Um, so, Dr. Osman, as you're going through, you know, this pursuit of knowledge that started uh, when you went to college, um, was there any time where you felt like moments of doubt? And, and if you did, like, how did you overcome those? Yeah, Jazakallah khair. Alhamdulillah, by the blessing of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I've never um, experienced any sort of a serious doubt about Islam. And um, and I think the reason for that is there's a few, number one, it's just it's the, it's the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that never been tested with that. But uh, a couple of things. One was seeing kufr, like with my eyes, Right. And seeing what that lifestyle was like showed me very early, like, you know, like 18 years old. I was like, all these other ways of life are disgusting, repulsive, and there's no foundation which they live upon. Right. So mm. it's never like there's another way of life that's better. Now, the second thing was that there's always questions as to, well, why do we do this and this that? And so those are minor issues. Right. Like, why is this a ruling for here? Why can't I do this? And that, alhamdulillah, I was just very blessed again to be always have mentors around me. I, one of the first things that I did when I was uh, in college was uh, enroll in a few different halakas in the community. And just having a senior person, right, who's 10, 20, 30 years my, my, you know, older than me, to be there any question, 
just, just I'm like, look, I got somebody on speed dial, right? I can text message them, or right? I can phone, I can call them, right? Um, it was just very, very liberating to feel like I never had to sit with those questions for too long. So, um, my, I mean, my advice is that if anybody ever has those issues, like you've got to find real people, right? We live in a world where it's like all social media, right? Like you ask somebody on social media, they don't know who you are, right? You can go and tweet at some sheikh and say, give me the answer. But until you sit with somebody, say, sheikh, this is what's on my mind. I'm not understanding this, or I don't understand that. They know who you are. They know your background. They know your life history. They know your psychology. They know where you're at with your iman. They will give you an answer that satisfies you. Because not all answers that are textbook correct are going to satisfy you know, the question, right? So I was very fortunate right, to have that um, network of brothers around me uh, and scholars around me. And, and to this day, I'm so fortunate to reward them. Absolutely. You know, SubhanAllah, it reminds me of this um, story we know of Ibn Abbas radiallahu an, that one person came to him and asked him, like, is it if someone commits murder, can Allah forgive them? So he says, yes, Allah can forgive the sins. So the man leaves. And then another day, weeks later, whatever it might have been, a different man comes asks him the same question. Can Allah forgive murder? And he says, no. And the students of Ibn Abbas, they turned to him later and they said, why did you say yes to one man and no to the other? He said, because I could see on the first person, he wants to repent. So I told him to repent. And I said, and I could see in the other person the signs of anger. And so I thought he might want to commit the sin of murder. So I told him no, so he wouldn't commit it. And it's just, you know, that aspect of, you know, the sheikh looking at the person in the face and, and seeing, you know, what that person's psychology is, where, where they are, giving them an answer based on that. Like you said, everybody right now is just completely online and that personal connection is just completely cut off. And I think we're all the worse for it. But I think that's such an important point to try to connect yourself to real people in your life. Yeah, subhanAllah, subhanAllah. Sheikh, if you don't mind, what was the sequence of your study? So, you you, you know, you you, I, you studied in Azhar for a while. Was that the beginning and then you came back and continued your secular studies? How did that go? Yeah, Jack, look at So, my, I would say my studies began in my college years. Um, so, alhamdulillah, I was a very avid reader. Um, and so, I always go through these phases in life, right? When I was in my teens, I would read sports, everything. Like, you know, you name it, any sport. But when you didn't know the Blue Jays, it's like, come on, man. How do you not know who the Blue Jays are, right? Like... Like you just I, like, anything about sports, I devoured it. Right, so I could tell you the stat about any player, what year, how many points they had, rebounds, assists. Sorry, Sheikh Ibrahim, nothing about hockey. That's like forbidden in, in my world, right? You know. But um, and then I went to like finance. I started reading everything about like the stock market. So I was just in this habit of like obsessively reading. And then so now when I like decided to become like a committed Muslim, I just literally was like just devouring books. And so that was the first path that I started upon. And um, I just. I, so, so that was the first thing, right? So through reading, uh, that opened up a lot of questions, which is why I was like, look, books can't tell me everything. So I found these shiuch to study with, right? And then my third year of college, something interesting happens. I used to hang out with a lot of, um, of uh, you know, we used to call them, this word may not be politically correct anymore, right? We used to call them the Fabi brothers, right? You know, they're fresh off the boat, right? They had just come from like Palestine, Syria, Lebanon, and they're always speaking in Arabic. So here I am in the MS, MSU, right? And I'm like, man, these guys, they speak Arabic all the time. They can understand the Quran. They can understand the Hadith. Like, I'm this miskeen, right? This impoverished guy. And I just got to rely on these translations all the time. And so I was like, I want to go learn Arabic, right? So I went to my university and they had a study abroad program. I was like, which Middle Eastern country can I go to? And they had a program in Egypt. So I went to the American University in Cairo during my third year of college studying engineering in the American University. But really, that was my cover for studying Arabic, right? I was like, I'm just there to study Arabic, but... So uh, I spent my first year that, that year just studying Arabic and you know doing some some Islamic studies. Uh, I came back, continued my harakat with my with the scholars in the community, and then I, to the point I just got too frustrated. I was like, look, there's not enough people who. This is the early 2000s, right? It's like mid 2004 or five around this time. I said, there's just not many people in the West right now where I live who are born in America speak English fluently, who understand the cultural context. I'm like, it's fort kifaya that I better get up and leave and go study. I was like, someone's got to do it. I better go do it. So I packed my bags. I took off one to Azhar with my, my wife. I had just been married for about a year. And alhamdulillah, my Allah reward her. She pushed me to. She's like, look, you stick in this engineering job too long. We're not going anywhere, right? She's like, let's just leave while you're still early in this. So I went to Azhar for about, you know, three, uh, what did I spend there? Three and a half years in Egypt, three years in Egypt. Um, unable to finish because the revolution took me out of there. Um, and then, yeah, continued my studies here and went back and did my master's and my PhD here. So, wow, wow. okay, it, it, there's a, there's an elephant in the room. You just and you just breeze by and say, Come on, 
You said the revolution took me out of there. And okay, you could be politically correct, but just like give us some experiences. Like, who told you, okay, you got to go? Or did you say, we need to get out of here? What to, what happened? Yeah, so this is uh, like December, right, of uh, 2010, if I remember correctly, right? Or November, so around the time of the Arab Spring, right? So the, like Libya was going through a whole lot, right? The airports had been bombed, right? And it's a neighboring countries, right? So Egypt was on edge. It's like, okay, like there was protests going around, but Hosni Mubarak was still in power, right? And uh, people were like, look, if these airports get bombed, you guys ain't going anywhere, right? You're stuck here. So Azhar actually shut down. Everyone, like all foreigners need to leave. And I remember this time, just to put the context, right? We were, it was, it was a police, it was like a militia out there. So, you know, the government wanted to like stick it to the people. So they pulled all like the military off the streets, right? They pulled all the police off the streets. And so now there's this kind of like chaos. So I remember like I'd be downstairs with a baseball bat doing my shift to make sure that no one comes to the neighborhood and does anything. <laughs> and we had like big rocks we'd put like on each street. Anyone who comes in, you gotta show the ID. So it was pretty crazy, right? There was tanks and barbed wire everywhere. So, you know, we, we eventually, you know, like, you need to get out of here. So I'm leaving. So now I can't skip over the juicy story that I usually skip over is as I'm leaving out of the airport, uh, I remember I was with uh, Imam Soheib Webb and I, right? We were good friends. And so he was with the same flight to New York and I'm trying to leave and I get pulled out of line by the uh, Egyptian secret services. Yes. And um, yeah, they give me a hard time. Uh, for another episode, you know, the hours I spent in an Egyptian prison under the airport, um, left alhamdulillah i was able to get out eventually but i'm banned from egypt so i could never go back and finish my studies so yeah. are you serious yeah i guess i was spending too much time organizing halakat and, and moving around the, the the scene right so gotcha gotcha subhanallah wow. so I had, a, I had a daughter who was one year old and my wife was pregnant when this went down so yeah Wow, what an experience. Yeah, that is a whole other episode, man. We yeah. need to make a theme series out of that. In the Yusra, that's the theme. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. well, Alhamdulillah. May Allah make things and, easy and for and you. On the other side, the FBI was waiting back in the US, but that's a separate story. Yeah. <laughs> that's the third episode now. <laughs> wow, wow. SubhanAllah. Um, so, Sheikh, let's move on to the, the next um segment uh, i think there's an a or hadith that you wanted to reflect upon today sure there's just so many when you asked me to pick one i was kind of like scratching my head for like hours like what, what can i possibly on, say Sheikh, if you don't mind if you don't mind yeah. i think there's something very important before we go off onto that Sheikh Ibrahim, if you don't mind sure. yeah go ahead i think it's very important that people know about your interaction with i can, i don't want to miss i don't want to misquote the title that dealing with surveys and data and, and collecting data because i think it's important that the average person that tunes into yakin knows that a lot of the research that we do i mean mashallah sheikh Osman is, is is the backbone to a lot of it because when it comes to the information and quoting that for instance this happens with muslims here or this percentage of, of muslims this was happens to them like for instance i'm with the convert life department we do surveys and we send them out to converts or you know convert organizations to gather information, to make sure that whatever we produce is has a strong foundation, i.e. with surveying and, and collecting data. So if you can touch on what made you get into that and then what is your role within Yakin and why it's important, okay? And then thirdly, which I learned from you sitting with you numerous times and hours is, you know, how there's a, if you wish, if you would, you know, if you can, how there's a fit or an understanding or a methodology in producing surveys. I didn't even know that, but you you enlightened me very much so. You know, subhanAllah, very, very interesting. So if you if you're able to to expound on that, I appreciate it. That's a lot. That's a lot to, to talk about. <laughs> yeah, no, that was like five, six questions. I think it's <laughs> yeah. important. I think it's important to know. So alhamdulillah, you know, it's you know, Allah facilitates and every experience we have in life, right? No, nothing is wasted. So I did my degree in engineering, you know, left became an imam right then left again went back to graduate school and when i when i was in graduate school you know i, I just i realized like my engineering background my math background made do, uh, statistics very uh easy for me and enjoyable and i saw the power of prediction and of of probing what people believe and do in terms of understanding future behavior so that was my whole phd was on like understanding what people believe in like fifth and sixth and seventh grade how it predicts who they'll become in their 20s and their 30s and their 40s and what parents believe and do when their kids are like seven eight years old how that predicts what their parent what they what their kids become in their 20s and 30s and 40s so i said look there's nothing that i know of in the muslim world 
that has done really deep systematic analyses of Muslims longitudinally to understand, look, this is like, that's Sheikh Ibrahim's question way at the beginning of the episode. What do we do with our kids, right? Do we do this, do we do that? We don't have answers because there's no precedent in our modern society and there's no data to actually tell us what is successful. So that was a, kind of my driver for kind of entering this role in Yatin. It's like, look, we need to quantify and understand what are people doing in the East, in the West, right? White, black, male, female, all these things, convert, non-converts, what's adaptive, what's maladaptive. So that's really what I try to focus on to understand that, look, okay, so people say, well, uh, like the recent paper working on, it's like, what does religiosity have to do with mental health? And it's like, you can just conjecture and argue and some will say, oh, it has nothing to do with it. I'm like, let's actually find out. So it turns out that when we do these studies and we probe people, realize, ah, believing in these things leads to these worldly outcomes that are really, really helpful. So religion and mental health have a strong relationship. The more religious you are, typically you find better thriving in life, right? Or if you parent this way, right, your kids will have a stronger identity this way. So that was kind of um, where the impetus came for really focusing on surveys in our work. Now the methodology, that's a whole, that's a probably another day in time, but like, I'll suffice to say that like, people should be cautious of statistics at times because you can lie with them as much as you can tell the truth with them. So by changing the way you word a question, it's like a lawyer, right? A lawyer knows how to ask a question in a way that can get a certain response. And so can a survey uh, engineer essentially, right? right? So, um, you know, you have to just be mindful that, you know, you might, be, you might get manipulated, right, in, in a survey to serve the interest, right, of, uh, of uh, I'll actually give an example about this. Recently, there was a survey that went out, some random survey, I forgot who ran it, it had to do with like LGBTQ um, identification in, in America. Mm -hmm. And they had some like large inflated number. And when you dig deep into it, it's the way they ask the questions facilitates a certain type of a response. And so you can actually now tell people, oh, look, you know, so many people identify as this and this and that, when it's like, that's probably an exaggerated number because if you ask it a different way, you've got a, a way lower number, right? Well, that's interesting because, you know, subhanAllah, you know, I, you know, the average person, I want to say the average person, you know, when they, you know, consume some content or something like that, or something comes in the email with a company, you don't want to answer these questions, right? But you would love to know the percentage of people that do this. Yep. <laughs> but you have to participate in that as well. And that's one thing you taught me, you know, subhanAllah. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. We don't want to sit there and, oh, God, that's okay. Yeah, okay, I'm this color. But then when you see the information, you appreciate it. So yeah. I, think, I think that's something that's very enlightening for me. And, you know, with a lot of things we're doing with these imams, you're going to do surveying. You know, we're going to have some stuff with converts as well coming out again. So those of you that may know a convert to Islam or a convert yourself, please take five or ten minutes to answer these questions. It's intentional. We want to help serve. And that's ultimately why we're here, inshallah. You know, this is the way that we want to serve Allah SWT. So Jazakallah khair for that. But you, you got to promise us a whole another episode on that as well. I think it's important that the general public understand the whole process because that was very enlightening to me. Jazakallah khair. Yeah, I'll, I'll add just one point because it's so relevant to what we've recently been doing. So people often talk about what is the role of religiosity in life. And so they'll do all these surveys, right? These large organizations globally will do it. And they'll say things like, oh, religiosity doesn't matter or religiosity has a small effect. And when you, when, when you wonder what, what do they mean by religiosity, they ask a question that says, for instance, how often do you go to church, right? And like, that's their measure of religiosity or how often do you go to the masjid? Or they might ask like, uh, how religious do you feel you are? So I'm like, those are really not good measures of what it means for us to be a practicing Muslim right, to like live Islam. There's so many dimensions, right? So we developed like a very intricate uh, measure that we call basic, right? Your beliefs, your attitudes, your spirituality, your institutional connections, your contributions to holistically understand what it means to be a Muslim and how does your holistic practice influence your life? And it was incredibly powerful and predictive in so many things that matter, right? Mental health, relationships, right? You know, peer relationships, like, you know, it just, you know, it blows everything else out of the water because we actually started with, Islam's definition of religiosity rather than some non-Muslim off-the-shelf secular definition, right? No, that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Again, going to the foundation and making sure we don't start somewhere that's built on some other foundation that's not conducive to our, our creed and our foundation. That's, that's beautiful. Jazakumullah khairan. All right. So, Sheikh Ibrahim, you want the ayah? He's waiting. <laughs> He's waiting, man. All right. So, no, actually, I, I'm really happy you brought that up because... Sometimes people ask me, like, what do you think is the most important thing Yaqeen does? And I, I, always, I always say data because, you know, even, even if you have different, you know, different, different approach to answering questions, maybe that some of the fellows at Yaqeen might have, everybody makes use of the data. Even if you're a masjid, even if you're 
you know, a conf Islamic conference, you want to know, hey, what topics should we address? Maybe look at the doubt survey, right? You want to know how to deal with converts? Maybe look at the convert survey. Even if like every single masjid and organization in North America, uh, in the Western world really can can make use of the data that, that you are producing, alhamdulillah, you and your team. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward you for all of your work. I mean, ya Rabbi. Let's follow that, inshallah, with the... <laughs> well, you guys are the ones who design all this stuff, right? Shaykh Abdullah is heading the convert stuff, so I'm just helping you. You know, Shaykh Ibrahim, you're doing all the imam resources. I'm just trying to create a survey to help you. So, But but really, I mean, like, helping each population, that's what we're really trying to do, because converts are different than imams, right? They're different mm -hmm. than an immigrant Muslim. So knowing what each of them do is so important, right? So bismillah, the, the ayah I want to share with today um, is an ayah from Surah Al-Baqarah, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about um, fighting of all things, right? That Allah Quran says that fighting has been prescribed upon you, although it is something that you do not like. So my explanation is not going to be about fighting, but it's about the next part of the verse where Allah Subhanahu says, "Wa asa an takrahu shay'an wa huwa khayrul lakum, wa asa an tuhibu shay'an wa huwa sharul lakum." Wallahu yalamu an tum nataalamu. This principle to me, like if it was halal to get a tattoo, this is what I would tattoo on my arm. It's not halal, so no one do it, right? Right? But like it's, it's this verse I just want to like have pasted everywhere, everywhere I go, I'm reminded of it, which Allah is telling you that he gave fighting as example, right? You know, Allah has asked us to fight even though it's something we don't like. But then he tells us the reason. He says, perhaps there are things that you don't like in this life, but those things are in reality good for you. And perhaps there are things that you really like and you love in this life, but those things are just actually bad for you. And Allah knows and you do not know. And so I, I wanted to select this um, because I, I study motivation quite a bit, right? And why human beings do what they do and, and what drives their behavior. And so many times what drives human behavior is our own pursuit of what we think is in our self-interest, right? So if I think that something is going to be good for me, right, I'm going to want to go and do that. If I think something's going to be bad for me, I'm going to abstain from doing that. But what Allah is telling us in this verse is that human beings, hold on just a minute, put the brakes on. Your intellect is not so developed to fully understand where all the good lies and where all the evil lies. You need to rely upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to be the one who determines as our creator where good is and where bad is, despite the fact that your nafs will actually will, will play games with you. Right? Our fitrah will tell us that something is good when in reality it's bad. And our fitrah will tell us something is bad when in reality it is good. And so I, I, I bring this up because in the world that we live in today, especially for those of us who are living in non-Muslim societies, it's always this rationalization that people get into, which is, I know Allah and his messenger tell us to do these things, but I want to do things that are good for me, right? It's like, I had this, you know, all the time, but especially with money, it's obvious. It's like, I know Allah's interest is haram, but how can I not take interest? In, it'd be foolish for me not to take interest in today's society, right? It's good for me to take interest, right? Or, you know, I hear this as well, like, Sheikh, I know we're not supposed to mingle with opposite gender and, you know, have like, you know, relationships, but like, how am I ever going to get married? How am I going to know if this is the one I'm supposed to marry? And this goes back to this fundamental premise that if you think that way, one doesn't, well, you don't want, you don't want to admit it, but it's, you believe that you know what's best for you. And that that is something which we need to learn is not true, right? At many, many, many levels. I'll give some funny examples that you might think are, I mean, they're silly but they get at the core of this behavior, right? They've done these really cool studies where they do things like they take somebody and they say, okay, Shaykh Abdullah, if I was to ask you, would you like to sit in like a giant cardboard box that's dark for like 20 minutes? Do you think that'd be a fun thing to do? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, you're, 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 okay, there you go, right? Yeah, everyone says no. They're like, that's gonna be terrible. It's gonna be horrible, right? And they would do this. They literally do these experiments and they put the person in the giant cardboard box and sitting in a chair and it's dark and they can't use their phone. They can't do anything. Right. And after 20 minutes, they ask them, how was the experience? And they find that people consistently rate the experience as being far better than they perceived it to be. Right. And then sometimes they do the opposite. They've given them things like uh, some like a, like a, like a word processor and say, okay, I want you to correct this, like all the errors and the commas and like, how painful is that going to be? And they're like super, super painful. And they go through it and they find it not to be as painful. The point of these studies is that, look, things that like a human being thinks would be obvious, like, yeah, this is going to be fun or this is going to be terrible, are often like we're really, really off on. And this is like silly things of life, not even like serious things, right? Let alone things that have like these massive implications for like human well-being and like, you know, like 
you know, the way a society should live and these laws that can influence like poverty and, 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 and wealth and like, you know, war and like justice, like these macro issues. And we think that somehow we're just going to know them, right? You don't even know that if the bur the restaurant you go to, you're like, oh, I think this burger is going to taste great. And you go and like, oh, that burger was terrible, right? Like we can't even predict if that meal is going to be delicious, right? Either you can predict like, you know, how much money should go to this person or this transaction should be halal and, you know, talking to this girl this way is right and wrong. No, you don't know. And the sooner that we can just absorb this, right? And, and Allah talked about this in the Quran in another place, and I, and I find it really nice because nothing is nicer than people going to a sheikh and, and framing a question to get the answer they want. It happens all the time. You've both, you've both gotten it, right? Or like, you know, they set you up and you're like, you know, you're like, I know what you're doing because you want this answer, right? And Allah talks about this, right? He says, وَعَلَمُوا أَنَّ فِيكُمْ رَسُولُ اللَّهِ right? Know that the Messenger of Allah is amongst you. لَوْ يُطِيعُكُمْ فِي كَثِيرٍ مِنْ الْأَمْرِ لَعَنِتُمْ That if He was to obey you, right? In so many of these issues, you would be in hardship. Right? And that's again something that like with age, like I think I've stumbled across where it's like, stop trying to use your mind to say what is good for you and what is bad for you. Like, I really don't know. And what I find most enjoyable about this is that it's not just a test of doing what Allah wants, but I see it as a test that people are always looking for the sweetness of Iman. Right? It's that elusive thing. You hear this in this hadith that, you know, there's, there's a sweetness to Iman. And I was reflecting and I'm like, you know, just doing, if I do the things that my nafs wants to do, that Allah also wants me to do, like, like my nafs tells me that it's bad to, for instance, like, kill somebody, right? And so I don't, and Allah tells me not to kill somebody. So I'm like, that, that's not where I'm going to find like this deep insights into life by doing the obvious that I already wanted to do. But it's in doing those things that my nafs like, you really, really want to do this. But Allah is saying, that's not good for you. Or you really, really don't want to do this. And Allah is saying, that's what you need to do. That is when the, fruit, fruit, the sweetness of Iman will manifest, right? That is when one will say, aha, man, Islam is beautiful. Right, man, Allah has a wisdom and his messenger that like, man, I just never fully appreciate it. But it's you've got to go through those experiences of saying, I want to do this, but I'm not going to do it. Or I, I don't want to do it, but I got to do it. Right? It's so many things that are counterintuitive in life, right? Like who imagines that like, okay, getting up like every morning, like go tell like a random like non-Muslim, right? Like, you know, yeah, yeah, like, you know, I go to sleep maybe at like midnight, had a long day. But then I get up at like five in the morning, all right, and I do my salah. It's like, aren't you exhausted, right? Aren't you like, you know, beat? And I'm just like, man, if I miss my salah, I feel lethargic, right? I feel lazy, right? You know, when I do my fajr, right, and I get up, and, you know, of course, if one is doing the hajjud even on another level, I'm like, it's counterintuitive. You're saying getting less sleep in this case is making you more efficient and productive and more wholesome. I'm like, yes. Why? Wallahu ya'lamu wa antum ma ta'lamu. Because Allah knows us. And we do not know ourselves, right? Right? Like, you know, we sit there scrolling all day on our phone thinking somehow this is going to make us happy. And then we're just like, man, what in the world did I just do, right? We don't know what's good for us. And this is where liberation lies and not having to make that choice for yourself and like struggle and say, you know, it's like, look, Allah knows. Whatever Allah you want me to do, I'm going to do it because I know I'm going to find khair for me there. Right? And that is what we want to internalize. It's like Allah's always looking for the khair for us. Right? And that's goes back to this freedom, right? If you want to be free, Allah is walking you to freedom, right? If you're going to walk that path with him, right? And then, you know, you get that hadith putsi, right? You know, people are always looking for this enlightenment, right? And, you know, the Prophet said that hadith where Allah SWT said, right, that nothing, my servant doesn't clo get closer to me than more than doing more than doing anything other than the obligatory. And then he gets closer to me by doing the nawaf and the superrogate, you know, the voluntary until I love him. And when I love him, Right, that I'm his seeing by which he sees, his hearing which he hears, his hand with which he strikes. And like that level comes with following this type of guidance. Right. I don't want to do it, but I'm gonna do it. Right. And so that's 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 my reflection. So Yeah, I want to uh, rip it off and make a khutbah for myself for, for Friday, inshallah. <laughs> Just take some of these points and, and use them on Friday. SubhanAllah, I think it's so important. It's such a common question, right? Why is this time so restrictive? Why do I feel like it's, you know, I can't do the things that I want to do? And I think that just that insight of like, You don't know what's good for you, right? You could not possibly understand what's good for you. That's such a powerful, it, it might be difficult for young people to understand, but it's such a powerfully true thing, subhanAllah. Um, how many times in our lives we thought like, oh, if I don't marry this person, I'm going to be so sad. 
And then like a week later, a month later, you're like, Alhamdulillah, Allah saved me from this person. Yeah, like, things exactly. like that happen in our lives all the time, subhanAllah. You know, I have this analogy, if you don't mind, I'll share that kind of captures some of this. Right? Um, Shadal, you have a point. Go ahead, make that first. No, 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 no. And I, I've been I've been toying with this. I call it the, the chocolate chip analogy of Islam, right? Um, which is, you know, everyone loves chocolate chip cookies, right? Mm -hmm. But when you think about the ingredients that go into a chocolate chip cookie, they're not all delicious, right? There's like flour, there's like salt, right? There's like, you know, like baking soda or baking powder, right? There's butter, there's eggs, right? And then there's sugar, right? And I, and, I, and I was reflecting, I'm like, look, if we were like, if I just said, hey, you know, eat the sugar, right? That, that might get too gross as well, right? If I said just, if I said eat the eggs, right? Like that's nasty, raw eggs, right? Eat like the salt. But like Islam is like that chocolate chip cookie. Like all of these ingredients, right? Like it's when they come together that that chocolate chip cookie comes together and it's just delicious and melts in your mouth and you're just like in heaven, right? That, 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 that state of, of spiritual awakening, right? That you, you, know, you rarely get to, right? And like, I tell people, I'm like, it's, you, it's, you gotta see it's done that way. There's things, you're not gonna like them. There's salty things sometimes. Your nafs doesn't like it. But if you don't do it, you're not gonna get that full experience. So it's kind of my metaphor that I've tried to kind of think that, you know, everyone likes chocolate chip cookies. So when you say Islam is like chocolate chip cookie, then it makes Islam like more enjoyable and tastier. <laughs> you know, that's interesting. I remember when I was in my first year, man, in, in the University of Medina, Usul we were going through a road to another for Bible Qudama. Mm -hmm. A uh, book of uh, Islamic jurisprudence, or you say Islamic theory, uh, Islamic theory of law. Um, and I remember in the hashi and the footnotes by Dr. Ismail Shaban, he mentioned it was a certain mas'ala or issue he was talking about, but then he branched off and he was talking about how Allah is the repository for good and evil. And it was just like, boom. Mm -hmm. Like Allah, you know, Allahu Ya'lamu, just, you know, when teaching the names and attributes of God, I highly implore all of us, you know, that. If there's a lesson on names and attributes of Allah to really get involved in that, because it's so profound, it takes you to the, it serves as your anchor. You're thinking that, okay, we, everyone says Allah knows everything. And it doesn't make sense to say Allah doesn't know dot, dot, dot. So if that's the case, he knows the sirun wa alani. There's not a leap that falls from a tree except that he knows it. When he said that, that he's the repository, he is the source of disclosing what good and evil is, regardless of your limited intellect, opinion, et cetera. So subhanAllah, Jazakallah khair for that reflection. It just reminded me of that. Hey, Sheikh, you want to play some rapid fire questions? <laughs> Not really. I'm terrible at this game, but let's do it. <laughs> All right. Actually, there's a few questions people put in the chat. I want to throw okay. them out here because we did market this as the scholar who's a baller. <laughs> I didn't see that. You know what? Now it makes sense. I was so confused. I got a text message this morning from our dear beloved Muhammad al and he's, his text message said, "You're a baller." Like a question, like you play ball, and I'm like, and I responded. I said, "Does a bird have feathers?" Like, of course. <laughs> he asked the question. Now I understand. Okay, good. Okay. But, but right. before that, before that, the Nets or the Lakers, brother? I mean, LeBron, what's going on? I mean, I'm not a Lakers fan, so I, I'm I'm happy that they're not doing so well. <laughs> it's a non-Lakers fan. And who, mm. who do you follow, Shah? I've okay. always been contrarian. So um, you know, your your you know, your 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 buddy, you know, Hakeem, you know, I used to love a lot, you know, Hakeem Olajuwon and the Rockets back in the day, Jordan and the Bulls, right? And even I picked the Clippers over the Lakers, man. So I just I'm a no Laker guy. No no Lakers, no Dodgers, right? I, I do the opposite. So mm, okay. that's why I find alhamdulillah, like I, it's fun practicing Islam because I just do the opposite of what everyone else is doing in life, right? <laughs> <laughs> Here's, here's a question from the audience. Who is your favorite basketball player? And who do you want to play a game with? Shaq, LeBron? Question mark. Good question. So my favorite player of all time, I, I just, I'm old school, right? I got to say Jordan, right? It's just, it's, it's, it's like, it's too beautiful watching that movement, right? Um, so I've always been a Jordan fan to this day. He's the GOAT, right? He's the greatest of all time. Um, who do I want to play with? I love to play with Shaq, to be honest. Shaq is a phenomenal personality. One thing I learned about Shaq recently that I love this guy goes out every single day and just goes and like gives like khair to people. Like he'll go to a store, find some kid, buy him like a bike. He'll go to like a store, like he bought like a family, like a van. Every day he goes out and he does this. So like his like, mashallah, his like personality is very like uh, like warm and loving. Like uh, I'd just love to spend some time with Shaq and play with him. Plus, you know, uh, I play basketball with Shaq Tahir. And so like, you know, when he posts me up, like, you know, I feel that pressure. 
but Shaq will take it to another level. So I played against the dream, man. I know, I know, man. I'm so envious of you, man. The dream, man. He, I was, I was trying my hardest. He's just laughing, backing up. I'm like, this is the NBA. Man. I have no like, I do man. Yeah, strong. Was it, was it recent or no? This was years ago. I mean, because we know we know him in Houston, but uh, subhanallah, yeah. man. He's, I, I challenged him one day. He was like, Come on, man, that was a mistake, man. <laughs> Big mistake. But did, did you think you had a chance? Have you seen if, I, if anyone's a basketball fan? The funniest thing is when random basketball players that are like nobodies they get challenged. Have you seen these videos? It's absolutely hilarious. Like the worst basketball player in the NBA, like Brian Scalabrini, right? Mm -hmm. You know, like a guy you've never heard of. Someone will go to him like in a 24 hour fitness and they'll like literally challenge him and they'll lose like 20 to zero. Like there's, there, there's, 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 <laughs> yeah, I, I remember Dream told me, I remember Dream told me, he said, Hakeem Olajuwon, one, he said, he said, uh, he said, a lot of kids come from college, mashallah, they're good, they're good. And he looked me dead in the eye and he was like, the NBA is a whole other level. I said, whoa. <laughs> I can tell the way you said it. He said, the NBA is a whole other level. He's good in college, but the NBA is a whole other level. Yeah. So when Hakeem was in Toronto, Raptors legend, um, he used to attend my father's masjid. And uh, oh, I did get wow. to meet him a number of times and he would attend my khutbahs a, a number of times. I just remember the first time I prayed next to him, I lost my concentration in Salah. May Allah forgive me. Because I couldn't help but realize his thigh was <laughs> twice the size of my thigh. <laughs> and it just took my concentration away, subhanAllah. If you pray into Shaykh Abdullah Dura, you're going to feel the same thing. <laughs> 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 all right here's the second question in the chat vince carter or tracy mcgrady as a raptors fan i feel hurt oh. both, so you go ahead and they're like homeboys you can't pick between the two of them uh i mean obviously vince carter had the dunking on, on mcgrady but man mcgrady is he's smooth man silky silky man yeah I, I love watching this game yeah i unpopular opinion i feel bad for everybody who's not a sports fan right now but uh I feel like even though Vince Carter was the better talent, he never lived up fully to his talent. And yep. Tracy McGrady was had a better career at the end. Okay, other questions we got. Um, I like these questions. Keep them coming. <laughs> uh, so these are just random general questions. Answer rapidly. Uh, do you prefer chai or coffee? Chai. I actually don't drink coffee at all. Yeah. We have that in common. I don't drink coffee at all either. Uh, mountains or oceans? Mountains. Hmm. Even though you live on the ocean. Uh, I live next to both. Mountains are also not far by, that far, far away. The problem with California and oceans is you can really only go in the evening to avoid like the fitna. So, um, mm. mountains are good, man. What is your favorite city? And you can't say Mecca or Medina. You know, I've never been to either yet, so I, I, I couldn't I couldn't say those. So inshallah, the time will come. But favorite city, uh, I love Istanbul. Like mm. that, that place, inshallah. So, yeah, that's a good one. Uh, what's the most beautiful place you've ever seen? I guess a kind of same question. You know, that's to, uh, I'd probably say uh, Yellowstone National Park. I want to feel that ever it, it is the most unique landscape I've ever witnessed, uh, and I just was sucker from the national parks, and I'm just an all alone in there. So you're standing there, and the, you see geysers shooting up and steam coming out, and all kinds of amazing blue and green lakes. It's, uh, it's so majestic. But I gotta kind of, I, you need to take me to Banff for Jeff's version. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I keep telling Sheikh Abdullah too, like, you gotta check these places out. I mean, it's at least once in your lifetime you need to go go see it, and it's not too far from you guys. It's probably not too expensive to get a flight out there. All right, so we and Abdullah are going to come meet you there, and we're going to record our future episodes from. <laughs> All right, <laughs> it's a date. Inshallah. Okay, um, what's the most interesting thing you've ever tasted or eaten? That's hmm. interesting thing. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm actually not very, like, I love adventure and trying all kinds of different experiences in life. I don't do that with food. So I'm, I'm very, like, safe. Uh, so I'll eat, like, exotic fruit. So, like, lychees and these type of things I love. Those are, like, the things that I, I look for, like, tropical fruits. So. 
No, that's an answer. I mean, Sheikh Dawood gave us last week uh, the durian fruit. <laughs> oh, no, I, I, I won't go near that, man. I think it's too much, man. I couldn't either. Okay, are you the kind of person who could sleep on an airplane? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I can sleep anywhere, anytime. <laughs> this is a gift I'm envious of. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, Okay. What job do you think you would be the worst at? Hmm. What job would I be the worst at? Uh, come on, man. That's, that's a tough question. Uh, I'd be terrible at a lot of things. Oh, an artist. I have absolutely no artistic talent. Like, I can't draw a stick figure. My five-year-old laughs at me when I try to draw, and all my kids do. So it's just one of those things that I wasn't given as a gift. So. Fair enough. Uh, what superpower do you wish you had? Ooh. Huh. Superpower. You know, I love Suleiman's story, right? Ali Salam, right? And so um, I think being able to like uh, control the jinn would be pretty intense, right? <laughs> but but uh, or control the wind. But so, so one of Suleiman's powers, man. That guy, that, mashallah, man. Like uh, I just dream about what it would be like to live in his kingdom. So. Small shameless plug. Tell us about your <laughs> books. Sir. Tell us about your books. Are you going to huh? That's why I wrote it, man. I just love that story. And I was like, it's just such a fantasy story, man. And I wanted kids to be able to see it. So what's the title? Tell us the title. Let, let, them, let them Google it. Uh, the King, the Queen, and the Hoopoe Bird, right? The novel mm -hmm. about Suleiman. Excellent. Excellent. Mashallah. Uh, okay. 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 Similar one. But if you had to be an animal, which one would you choose? And why? Animal. Oh. You know, I don't have hops, so I can't jump high. That's like my limitation in basketball. So an animal I could jump high would be great. Like, you know, like a, one of those like leopards that can like jump up like 10 feet high. That would be fast and jumping high. I'd be set. There you go. It's a pretty good one. <laughs> okay. We got some questions in the chat for you, Sheikh. Uh, let's see. Here's a good one. Uh, in your opinion, Dr. Umarji, why do Muslims think or have a negative or not so positive reaction when it comes to the word psychology and the subjects of it? What is your favorite thing in psychology? Yeah, so I think Muslims have, uh, rightfully so, and they should be skeptical of a lot of the social sciences and their foundations. Um, whether it be psychology, economics, sociology, anthropology, all of these fields, right, they are coming from a certain paradigm and worldview. So I think the skepticism is is good that you don't absorb it, you know, completely uh, as, as as some sort of you know revealed haq and, and truth. At the same time, there are there's a lot of truth in them. You just have to dig and understand it. So you know, psychology is a study of the human mind, right? And you know, you can call it whatever you want to as an English word, right? You know, we can call it ilm al nafs, right? We can call it anything. And there's an Islamic version of that. So I don't think Muslims Muslims should be averse to psychology as a subject because we have a huge tradition in our you know, from, from centuries, both the Quran, the Sunnah, and the ulama have talked about human psychology in, in detail. But modern Western psychology is where I can see that people should be cautious and wary of. Now, what I love the most about psychology, so my training is, is an engineer and then as a jurist, right? So like Shia Abdullah, you know, like Usul and like Sharia, like these are the things that I was into for years. But then when I began to work with the community as an imam and working with the youth and with parents, I realized that you know, you're not a judge. You're not there to just tell people right and wrong. We're there to move hearts, right? Because the heart has to accept this truth before, that's the biggest motivator of anything. Right? So when it comes to psychology, what I love is that it helps us understand how to get people to do what they're supposed to do, right? Especially from a, from a faith perspective. Because again, you've said this, you can tell someone this is haram, but they're dying to do it. Or you tell someone this is like wajib and they don't want to do it. So psychology helps us understand what underlies human behavior and this is why Ibn Qayyim, rahimullah, and some of those great Muslim scholars use that science to actually move us in the direction of getting closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is another question. Uh, so I can, can you give a source to the study you mentioned about people not knowing what they perceive as good and bad, the people who are in the cupboard or box? Um, I don't know if you have that offhand. Uh, I, don't, I don't have a citation offhand, but these uh, this is something a motivation which means like people's perceptions of what what motivates them and it's pretty much so if you type in into any like academic journal um like meta meta, meta motivational studies you'll see all these different vari variations of these studies where um people will be put into scenarios asked what they'll think about them 
and then you'll see just how wrong they are about their predictions, right? And even when they put them in the brain scanner, the same thing happened. Their brains, you know, were completely different than what they, they, they thought that they wouldn't find it rewarding and all their reward circuitry is going off in their brain, right? So meta motivation is the term to find. Maybe I can post it in the in, in the YouTube later, the specific links to the papers. Inshallah. Uh, one more question here. Uh, Sister Raihana, she says, what tips would you provide in keeping teenagers firm on their deen? Yeah, okay. great question. Um, I'm sure you both have wonderful things to add to that, but if the, one of the most important things I can say is is, is good sahbah, ensuring that your teens, teenage years, one of the biggest aspects is developing that sense of belonging. And so when I mentioned my story early about why did I even look at the fraternities as a place to go, because they were really about that camaraderie and that friendship and having a space where people feel like they're valued and part of something bigger than themselves. Um, our youth need the exact same thing. When they're in public school all day long, right? they're looking for belonging in that space. We need to provide for them a healthy outlet of most good, high quality Muslim spaces where they can feel like they belong there. So we're not gonna rate, no matter how much Quran you give your kid, no matter how much you know, YouTube shiuch that you know, they listen to, not be, they need to be in the presence of other people who are reinforcing that identity which they need to keep. Even to the extent that if the knowledge that they're getting is less and not as high quality, like that's fine because this is a, we're, in the, we're in this long term. We want this identity to perpetuate for a lifetime, not for it to be a fad for a few years. So find a good circle of Muslim youth that your kid can be around. And that means that parents have to be willing to make friendships with those families as well. And you got to create a village for yourself, right? That's the best advice that I can give. Also, what we do as human beings is copying other people, right? We don't really want to admit that. We think everything we do is rational and I do it because I believe in it, right? We, we imitate. So if they're around other good people, they will imitate that good behavior, inshallah. Absolutely. Just um, This is a question we were going to ask you, but someone in the chat asked it. So it's good. Two no. birds with one stone. Uh, what advice would you give your younger self and or what is something you wish you knew when you were young? All right. So the advice I would give myself um, is stop getting upset when things don't go your way. Because when I grew up, I was, alhamdulillah, you know, Allah had, had blessed me with, uh, you know, parents who put me in good schools and good educational opportunities. And I always felt like I was deserving of things, right? So it's like, well, I did well, I should get into this university. Oh, I did well, I should be able to get this job. And so anytime I would get a setback, it would bother me a lot. And I'd feel slighted and like the world is not fair. And I'd go back and tell my young self, stop getting upset. Why? It, it might not, it doesn't matter. It might not have been fair. But Allah has a wisdom in everything he does. Allah closes doors that he knows are not good for you, and he opens doors that are good for you. And I look back now and I tell myself, I got rejected from the top schools that I applied to, despite the fact I felt I had all of the, the grades to get into there. Right? I got rejected from jobs that I applied to, despite the fact I had all the qualifications. And I look back and I say, well, I got rejected from the universities I was dying to go to. And Allah took me to another university where I found my faith and I found my wife. Right? So Allah knew what was best for me. I, I, the jobs I applied to, I didn't get. I got a different job that, again, put me around good Muslims who were in that job. We used to have, like, you know, like uh, salah every day, dhuhr and asr and maghrib in our offices. Like, Allah facilitates if you follow the open doors that he opens and you accept the closed doors. So it's just, just don't get upset. Allah knows what he's doing. It goes back to that first premise, right? You think you know this job is good for you? You think this school is good for you? You think this woman is good for you? Just just chill. All right, wasn't meant to be. Allah has his qadr. He, he knows what he's doing. I love that. Just chill. That's a that's good advice to give. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Oh, Jazakallah khair, Sheikh, for being with us and giving us your time. Um, I think it was a great session. Sheikh Abdullah, I don't know if you have any questions uh, you want to ask before we wrap up, but Jazakallah uh, khair. Uh, I know, I know yeah. we asked a lot of you and, and uh, for you to give us some time. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. Okay, man. You're awesome, man. As y'all can see now, mashallah, man. He has a lot to offer. It's always benefit when I'm talking to him. And uh, may Allah bless you in Al California. And the brothers over there. I you, the brothers there, man. Inshallah, we'll look forward to meeting you all in person. Sheikh Rahim, I'll meet you in Toronto soon. And then we've got to have you down in California, inshallah. 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 Inshall